Okay, thank you very much for, uh, I've only been once to one of these lovely workshops before. Uh, the European University has been uh, through a difficult time. Uh, think a little bit like other European universities, in, for example, Hungary. And it's, it's great that you're all back again. And, and so I think it's, thank you very, very much for asking us to come here uh, in, this, in this most beautiful and most European city. I'm going to talk a bit about um, risk and, and, asset, and, and, and asset pricing as well, but also pricing carbon. So it's a lecture, so I will talk, the first part will be about uh, big European pricing and how to take all kinds of risks. Let's work together with Tom von der Bremen. Second bit, I will talk a bit about stochastic hoteling rules, so if you have a carbon budget approach. And the third thing, I will be more on stranded assets and what happens, how would you price assets in stock markets and how are they affected by carbon risks, policy tipping risks and other stuff like that. So uh, in the room, uh, yeah, I suppose uh, I should mention Lucas Bletcher has done a lot of his work uh, uh, as well. Uh, some of the stuff is at first sight fairly similar and at second sight maybe less, but it is basically uh, a lot of similar stuff uh, under both one and three. And, and I will talk about it as I go. Um, so let me then first start with the, the, the first bit. Oh, no, 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 thank you very much, very kind. Yeah. So I can stand a bit like that. So, so the first bit is, so, so the first part of the lecture is perhaps the longest part of the lecture, but I want to do it anyway. So, and some of you will have already heard it, but I feel I'm, I get it now better than before. <laughs> so it's basically uh, a macro model. Uh, it's a DSG model, uh, stochastic, uh, AK growth model, but it has got the risky asset and the safe asset. And there are uh, lots of uh, stochastics in the model. Uh, and the economic growth is uncertain, and therefore emissions are uncertain. And they are just typically geometric ground emotion. But particularly temperature is very uncertain. The temperature response is very uncertain. So we distinguish short run and longer run responses. Short runs maybe 70 years after a trench of climate response. That's fairly normally distributed. But the long run, say the equilibrium climate sensitivity is very skewed. So there's a lot of tail risk. So there's a lot of skewness there. And there's a lot, it's much more volatile. So we capture that. We capture everything with a lot of power functions. But that, that's, that's a technical detail, doesn't matter. We could have used tipping points, or we could have used point processes, but we used these skewed distributions and to kind of show the effect of tail risk of the carbon price. Then we also allow for uh, uncertainty in the ratio of damages to GDP. And, and again, the, that may be skewed or may not be skewed. This is all a bit ridiculous because the more I read about it, I mean, apart when you look at the work of Burke and Michang, they have tried to estimate it. And, and before that, uh, Melissa Dell, Bell, uh, I believe it was, but all that integrated assessment literature, um, starting with Toll and then Nordhaus, they use damage function, which looks almost taken out of thin air. I'm being a bit unreasonable, but it's pretty crappy. I mean, if your PhD student would come back and say, this is the empiric, you say, go over, go over. He would probably kick them out. But, but, but anyway, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty in that, and so we allow for that. But the, so, so there's damage rate uncertainty as well. And then also we allow for carbon stock uncertainty, because there may be uncertainty in the way the carbon stock develops, that turns out to be so small it has almost no effect. So I probably will not say that much on it. My objective here with, with Tom is to get a, an analytical rule. So we have a rule, for example, which has been quite popularized by uh, Golosov and, uh, and his co authors. But that rule is a bit funny because that it's so simple, you've washed away the baby with the bathwater. I mean, yeah, because basically it's all logarithmic utility functions and all the risk uh, doesn't appear. In the, it's not a risk adjusted carbon price. It just doesn't have an effect. If you have a elasticity temperature equal to one, uh, basically it all drops out. So it's kind of not a really a stochastic rule as we would like it. So, 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 so this is a, a simple rule of stochastic. <coughs> and to be honest, and before I start, I would like you to know that we allow for the correlations between these four different types of risks. So we can also say something about hedging in an interesting way, which I think might be interesting. So the model is, we are working uh, um, with 
the finance guys to make this a more multi-asset model, the stochastic, it's not that easy because you have three models with two or three Lucas trees in a macro context. They're not, you can't pick them from off the shelf, but this is uh, unashamedly just a one sector model. Yeah. So, so normally, just those of you who don't realize it's elective, so we start saying, simple. normally this is the, the definition of a social cost of carbon. You just emit one ton of carbon today, and that, 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 that's, that's your F, that will increase the stock as at some future date in some way or another, there's some carbon cycle which will give that. Then, then the stock of carbon will increase temperature at some future date and the temperature will increase damages. And then you convert it into utils, you discount it all, and then, and then you, you divide it again by the amount of the consumption today to get it in euros. So that's just the, the definition of a, a social cost of carbon we teach to our students. And typically, if I teach it, so that to give, I say, ah, let's, let's make the utility uh, CES, so Marshall utility C to the minus gamma, say that the, 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 this square bracket, the, this curly bracket, do the Golosov assumption, so they, then the share, uh, 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 the, the damages are, the, that thing is, a, a theta is the, the, is, is, is the share of consumption per trillion tons of carbon are the damages, and DSDF, let's just assume an exponential decay rate. And then if you assume that consumption follows a geometric ground in motion with a drift G and volatility sigma, then you've got a model which you can write the answer to. Well, we can do it in two lines. Yeah, so it's very easy. But so just to show before I show it, make it more difficult to see what you can just teach to you. And then the result will be like this. So then the price, and it's easy to have maybe two boxes of carbon, a temporary and a permanent box of carbon, like in the goddess of models. I'm just cutting it down to one to keep it simple. So really, the price of carbon is proportional to economic activity. Why is it? Damages are proportional to economic activity. And secondly, you have to use some discount rate. And the discount rate is something plus the rate of atmospheric decay. <coughs> now, what is the discount rate? R star is like the, 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 the risk-adjusted discount rate, and it will look something like that. And so uh, typically it is the, the safe rate. These are all those who do finance uh, or macro will see that immediately. It's like it comes from the Keynes Ramsey rule. So it's rho plus gamma g, which is the discount rate plus an affluence effect. That the more affluent future generations, the higher the rate of interest, the less you do. But then there is this extra minus gamma one plus gamma sigma squared over two term. And that kind of uh, depresses the safe rate. And th that's also like to do, and then there's the risky rate gives the risk premium gamma sigma squared. And then this R star thing is just the risky rate corrected for growth because damages are growing. And then you get something like that. I will interpret this at length when I generalized it, but it's something like that you get out. So what, one thing we will generalize, like I mentioned this point. At this point, I've assumed that risk aversion and intergeneration and quality aversion are the same. One of our objectives is to use Epstein's in preferences or Gaulier, uh, so, so to say, Duffy Epstein preferences to separate out risk aversion from intertemporal substitution. So then it turns out that you get basically this formula, but then this is, this is risk aversion, intergeneration and quality aversion, and that's risk aversion. So you have to change it. So we show that as well. So this is normally what I would teach. I mean, if you just do something like simple, and that, but you can get it out pretty quickly. But it's all very exogenous, see. I mean, this is typically what Gollier does in his book. His whole book is about interest rates, and he assumes an exogenous process for the growth in consumption. So, so what we are going to do is make life a bit more difficult, and use the DSG model. So we have these four types of uncertainty I already talked about. Carbon cycle uncertainty, economic growth uncertainty, temperature response uncertainty, and climate damage uncertainty. Then the aims are, as what I already said, we're going to use uh, the solution method, will be perturbation methods, so we will get leading order estimates. So the idea is that we, we had lots of perturbation parameters, but in the end, one of them turned out to be important, and then one of them is the damage ratio of damages to GDP, call that epsilon. If epsilon is zero, then there is no global warming damages and really the model collapses to a model of say PINDAC and one and you can, we have an analytical solution. But if epsilon, then we perturb epsilon and then we get lots of first order, second order, third order, fourth order solution. We can go any order up we want. Indeed with algebraic programming, algebra, you can go anywhere you want. 
and those will give us the, the role we want. So if our price of carbon, if our if the, the damage ratio is order epsilon, the error in the price of carbon is order epsilon squared. So it's, 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 it will look quite good. That's, so that's what we do. So, um, so it's a continuous time model. Uh, uh, it's endogenous AK. Uh, we, oh, it's important to have adjustment costs for investment, otherwise we don't, can't model the stock market, we can't do the calibration right. We have only a risky asset, it's a claim on aggregate consumption, we have one safe asset. So, a little technical detail. Normally you will see something like the Arrhenius law. The Arrhenius law shows that temperature is a logarithmic function of the stock of atmospheric carbon. We approximate it by another concave function, not a logarithmic, but a uh, 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 say maybe a square root of it. It's, we, we calibrate it to a power function, just for ease to make sure that everything is working. And the probability density functions of the climate sensitivity and the transient climate response, we model it in one dynamic uh, Vazayak process, uh, or maybe you know that as an orstein ullenbeck stochastic process, and that's really like a continuous time version of an AL1 process. Then we take the power function transformers, these are normally distributed if you want, and then a power thing we can make as skew as we want or not. So that's the technicalities. There's a lot of e earlier work. So uh, then we got Inge. So Inge has also worked on simple rules and, uh, and, 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 and generalized it, and like I did also with the papers with Armin. Uh, uh, but really, it's those papers we I want to focus on. There's a paper by Pinnock and Wang. That's what we'll use as a base. But there's a, a string of papers by Alexandra, uh, <coughs> I don't know her surname anymore, but Vino Gradava, and, uh, and Lucas Bletcher, uh, uh, where they have these AK growth model, their stochastics, and in the sense ours is, is, a, is a sister, is related to that, that, those, those studies of, of Lucas. I mentioned one, but there are a number of them. Christian Traeger has done some work as well, but that makes it look more difficult. This makes it look easier. I like easy stuff, but you should look at it. He has a model called ACE, but I find it difficult to understand. That's me, that's not him, uh, I think. So, so. Anyway, so here we are. He quickly, I no, will not do the maths, but just to look quickly. This is recursive utility. So you, t you can't really write down explicit function of utility, but utility, the value function is a function of consumption and the value function. So it's really... This specification comes from Duffy Epstein. It's like it's like Epstein's in. It's like Krebs Porteus preferences. Yeah. So where gamma is the inverse of the elasticity of the triple substitution, we call it intergeneration the Goldie version, and eta is relative risk aversion. Then you have investment with adjustment costs. The AC quadratic adjustment costs. You have some depreciation rate. You don't have to remember anything, but just to give you a rough idea, here's your first Wiener process, and that's proportional to the coefficient. We haven't got any disaster shocks in there, we could, but we have, I'm leaving them out. And then there is, uh, output is either investor or it's consumed, or there is a cost for fossil fuel, and then there's a production function which is Cobb-Douglas. It's a bit of a tricky Cobb-Douglas function because it's AK, the coefficients on K and F add up to one, so it's like it fits in the endogenous growth literature. And then there's a TFP function, and TFP uh, depends on all kinds of shocks, like Key and lambda, key are the temperature shocks, lambda are damage shocks, damage ratio shocks, and E is the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. So here is this approximation to Arrhenius law. Don't look at the maps, it's not that important, but it's not a logarithmic, but say maybe it's it's like the theta E is, is negative, so it's like it's a concave function, that's the crucial thing. And then there are these shocks. This term here is what would be called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And we assume that key, key is driven by some normal type process, I will tell you in a minute. But by taking a, that this theta key is positive, we're taking a, a convex transformation, so that will become a right skewed distribution, and thereby we can fit the, the PDS. I will show you once I show you the calibration. And damages are proportional, you could say t squared, and theta t is one, but what have we uh, generalized and generally speaking like that. And there are some shocks to the damage ratio. So, so really, this is the reduced form damages. Reduced form damages depends on all of these things, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's. I will, I will explain this as I, as I, as I apply it, as I discuss the rule in a second. But basically, damages are a function of temperature. Temperature is a function of the carbon stock, so damages is a function of the carbon stock and the shocks. So, 
Here is the carbon stock dynamics, emissions, some depreciation and some extra noise. And these are these ornstein ullenberg processes in which have mean reversion parameters here and there, and thereby I can fit both the trench and climate response and the equilibrium climate sensitivity with one and the only one stochastic process. Um, again, the w, W3 and W4 are, are, two, are two, two other Wiener processes. So finally, um, what we allow for is that there are correlated risks for all these things. So, it's, so all I'm trying to say, it looks like a, quite an involved model. But what I'm going to show you is, uh, is there a solution for the model. I'm not going to show you, prove it. But I will give you the answer, and then we will discuss it. And then I think that, and, let, and let's see how it goes. But it's an analytical, so it's not a numerical answer, it's an analytical answer. So, so we focus on skewed risk, so not fat tail probability distributions. We could have alternatives like point processes, Poisson shocks, or tipping points. I've worked on these things in the past. And to be fair, I think uh, Lucas's work with Alexandra has more of these, these, these point processes to fit it. And of course, uh, uh, Barrow uh, does this as well. And this macro stuff, uh, we, we've, uh, we've abstracted from that. So in the end, we get this. So we get a risk adjusted. This is, it will look like this. So the structure of the solution will be like that. Uh, so I want to. Exp so this is a price of carbon, which is now proportional economic activity, which is like GDP. Strictly speaking, GDP with our global warming, and and then there is by some discount rate, which I will explain explain in a second, and and then and then it's proportional to that. This is a parameter how much of the carbon stock stays permanent in the atmosphere. But this just looks very much like like uh, like without this, it's very much like a global soft style model. Uh, except it's only one box, but you can put a load of boxes in there, it doesn't matter. But I get all these extra terms, boom, 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 boom. And I will explain these one by one as I go along. These increase or decrease this carbon price depending whether you have temperature uncertainty, damage ratio uncertainty, correlated shocks, and other forms of correlated shocks. So I will try to kind of explain it as I go along. But first, let me discuss the risk-adjusted discount rate. So this is the risk-adjusted price of carbon, and this is the risk-adjusted discount rate. So this is to be adjusted, for you already see this is a generalization of what I showed you on the first slide, that here we have inequality aversion and here we have risk aversion. So this is the one that you should remember. We can almost, so we know that if inequality aversion equals one, this whole thing drops out. Which is, that's using the Golosov model. Actually, the Golosov model has this one and that equal to one. So there's no uncertainty of, of economic growth, or I should say really, Asset returns, because in these models it's the asset returns. So asset return volatility, or economic growth volatility, has no effect on the discount rate and hence no effect on the price of carbon. So for that you need international this inequality version to be different from one. Typically it's two, bigger than one. So typically this is positive. But the, so let's split it up like this. So this thing here is this thing here. So here we say, ah, the discount rate is how impatient the policymakers are, Rho. And then we say, ah, the Ramsey rule. We say, if the growth rate, it's got a little zero, ignore that these are perturbations, that's the first order, it doesn't matter, it's more or less the growth rate. So, so if the future generations are rich, then you say, well, why would current generations say, do anything about the climate? Say, you guys are rich, so bugger you, I'm not going to do it, you do it. And, and then the effect of that, the more you care about inequality between generations, the bigger this effect. So these are standard. And, and this chapter is standard as well. Because that's just the decay of atmospheric carbon. Of course, the more the carbon goes back to the oceans at a bigger the speed, the, uh, the higher the discount rate and the less action you have to take, the less the, less the price of carbon, the less ambitious climate policy. But so, so, so the new, t then this term is fairly obvious as well. But that's the idea that damages are growing with GDP. So as GDP is growing a lot, damages are growing a lot, you, you have to take a lot of more action. So that you have a risk, uh, growth corrected discount rate, and that therefore uh, pushes up the price of carbon. So that's all standard, this is all standard. So these are the two new terms. S similar terms, some of them have been seen a bit again in earlier Traeger papers, but uh, not in this decomposition, and I think this makes more sense. I think there's a prudence term and an insurance term. 
if you remember your macro or your whatever you get taught, you remember being taught the uh, C1, C2, uh, then your second year undergraduate, and then they say prove uh, precautionary saving, and then you have to in different skirmishes, and then you have, it sticks out above it, and they give you Jensen inequality, and they say, ah, oh, you get precautionary saving. If marsh utility is convex, if the third derivative is positive, it's a typical exam question. I know it because I just had to correct it in Oxford for, for, for bloody second years. <laughs> but, but this is something similar. This one plus gamma is happens to be for this set of power functions the coefficient of relative prudence. It's the Kimball term. Uh, and this eta is the risk aversion, and it's proportional to the volatility. So you are more prudent, the more volatile, the more prudent you are, and the more risk averse you are. That pushes down the rate of interest, the risk adjusted rate of interest, and therefore makes you price carbon more. I think that's fairly obvious, fairly clear. But what is that, fir that, la that insurance term? Let's try to get the economics of that right before we move on. Think that in future states of nature, for some reason, stochastic shocks are such that economic activity is high. So consumption is high, marsh utility of consumption is low. So if in those, but in those play time, then damages are high. So then it's like the self-insurance term. So it just when you need to do something about it, you can afford to do it. So you, so you, you your rate of interest is pushed up and you do less because you're already self-insured. Imagine that damages are not proportional to GDP. Then, of course, in future state of nature, that would not be the case, that insurance term would drop out. Typically, what people would put in front of here, some people might put a term in here called beta, I call it theta. And that's kind of, it shows you the correlation coefficient between damages and GDP. And that's a kind of a beta. And then, so this shows you, this is like full insurance. It's typically what's built in all these models. There's a paper by Simon Dietz and others and Gaulier, and they call it the climate beta. But it's basically discorrelated, and then they find this, they simulate all these models, and then they, they ride back out a, a beta, and it's always one. Yeah, because it's in the model, I, I think. So, so but in the, empirically, it may not be one. But anyway, so, so, so this is the way to look at the risk of discount rate. If you have a, a detour, if you have non proportional damages, so imagine that this elasticity I just spoke about is indicated by theta d, then, uh, for example, maybe half. Then you find that uh, a smaller elasticity of damage with respect to GDP, or a smaller beta, actually decrease the insurance term, and therefore you get a lower adjusted discount rate and a higher carbon price. So basically, uh, what we see here, there are these two opposite effects of stock volatility, the prudence effect and the insurance effect. And in gamma is one, Minus a half times one plus one is one. These two cancel out exactly. But there are these two there. That's the important thing to remember. And then you can generalize this by putting an extra term in there. And then the reduced form expression will look like that. So, so you can get an extra result out of it. That's a bit of what who cares. Um, so then, if you look at the karma price, there were these terms. So these terms all multiplied. So now I'm going to teach you tell you each what each of these terms are in just intuition. So let's first look at these two terms. So these two terms are the effect of the volatility in the climate, in the temperature response, the climate sensitivity, and the volatility, the uncertainty if you want, in the ratio of damages to GDP. So, and there have been many empirical Monte Carlo studies to get at it. I don't like Monte Carlo studies. I, probably, I think probably Lucas doesn't like them either, but I, I will ask him in the, in the, in the interval. B because they have a strange assumption about uncertainty. They assume that all uncertainty is resolved at time one. And then, but of course, uncertainty is resolved all the time along, so you have to use dynamic programming. So all these Monte Carlo studies give very misleading results. Uh, Traeger uh, did it, and other people, well, no, mainly Traeger wrote a paper where he compared Monte Carlo by solving it properly using dynamic programs to get a dynamic program, and you get very misleading results. This is all these results of the right to stochastic dynamic programming, but we try to get insights. So let me look at these two terms. So, so, this, so this term, that's the first term, and that's the second term. Now, let's not look at it too much, but effectively what I'm, well, the first, you can see a few things already. 
you can see the volatility relative to the mean. So that's kind of if it's relatively volatile, you push it, you push things up. I tell you what, it will push up the price of carbon. But it will also depend on the rate of the discount rate and it will depend on mean reversion. So, so I think what we're trying to say, the first bullet, that climate sensitivity volatility pushes up the price if the right if the relative distribution is right skewed, uh, or damages are more convex. So if damages, if this parameter, uh, this one here, is only positive if damages are convex, so for example, quadratic, but if they were linear, or if the, or the distribution is skewed. So the, another way of putting it, the, you increase the price much more, the more convex damages, and, and the more, so Weizmann does this, and Stern do that, and the more skewed this distribution is. So if you don't have a skewed temperature distribution, you're ignoring the uh, many effects, kick on effects on the price of carbon. And it, it also mat matters uh, if, the, if, the, the, if the climate sensitivity shocks are less temporary and the discount rate is smaller. And damage volatility is easier. I've seen uh, papers, and they find, they do lots of numeric simulation, and they find, ah, there's almost no effect of the damages volatility on the price of carbon. I think we prove here that is if you have a normally distributed price of sense this distribution for carbon uncertainty, so if it's if it's not skewed, so this theta lambda term, which is kind of a skewness parameter, is zero, there will be no effect on the price of carbon. So it doesn't depend on the convexity of damages. So the damage volatility only has a direct effect on the carbon price if damage shocks are skewed. Uh, and more so if they're more volatile and more persistent. So this explains a lot of uh, uh, things people get out of numerical simulations. The nice thing about the rules is that you can put them into different models. So you can test robustness. And they actually seem to work reasonably well in different models. I've tried it, even though the models are quite, not quite different. But you notice, as in, as in the Golos of it all paper, many details of the production structure, like the elasticity of uh, factor substitution, or things like that do not appear in the rule. Uh, like they don't appear in English rule either. So there is this, that's the same thing in this rule. So this rule is probably much more general and you can put it in different kind of integrated assessment models. Okay, so then, uh, okay, there are some people who use damp, they don't have added, I have multiple of uncertainty, but some people put the uncertainty in the damp, in the temperature, in, in the coefficient. So it's coefficient, it's, it's curvature uncertainty. What we show here is, it's not important, but it's, it, it, it just makes the thing more skewed. And as temperature goes up, it gets more and more skewed. So you get more and more kicks on, kick -ons on the price of carbon. So we showed it analytically, and that's been shown already numerically before. So we, 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 we recover that. So uh, let's now go and look at, uh, I shouldn't do this, but this term, this, these two terms. So these are the, the, the first one is a hedging term. So let me show you what it looks like. So it's correlated risks. So we try to explain this term. So that's what the term looks like. I will tell you interpretation in a minute, but that's, I will tell you in a second what it means. But first thing to notice is one important thing. If risk aversion is equal to one, this whole term drops out. So all the hedging effects drop out. I've seen a paper by uh, Derek Lemoine, who doesn't solve it, but he, he suggests that it also depends on, uh, on, on the risk aversion being different from one for those effects to kick in. But here's the explicit formula. So let's try to understand those hedging effects. So imagine, let's take one. Let's take, for example, the Netherlands. So then if, uh, if, if, if uh, if there's a lot of damage rate uncertainty, then maybe the, 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 the Dutch have a beta which looks like this. So let me try to explain it. So maybe they might have. Um, this is a story. Yeah? So, so, the, so if there's a lot of damage in a future state of nature, then probably acid returns normally go down very much. But for Holland, they may go up if they have big salvage industries. So it depends on whether that this, this correlation coefficient is positive or negative. For most, damage rate uncertainty and economic activity may be negatively correlated. But maybe if you have a lot of salvage industries, if you have a lot of damages, your asset returns go up because all these people can go out and send kind of dredging stuff, building more dams and things is great for the Dutch economy maybe. 
So it depends on this. So what we're seeing is that if it's negative, and the risk aversion is bigger than one, in our model it's about four or five we calibrate, then, then, then typically, then, then if that's negative, and then, and then, and then, then it's, the, uh, it's an upward adjustment. So it's quite obvious because if damages are such that they are correlated on average with lower asset returns, then you get hurt by it, and then you want to price cut more. So this is a standard beta effect. In the Netherlands, because they like damages so much, in, well, they profit from damages because if there are damages, their self industry goes up. So that row is positive. So then they want to price carbon less vigorously than they would have done otherwise. So you're already getting some insights. And so I, th I think that makes, and obviously it also depends on the volatility of asset returns and the volatility of the damage rate on Trinity, and it depends on how persistent those shocks are. So I think, I think we can explain this reasonably well. Let's try to explain this term. So this is the correlation between uh, asset returns or economic activity and temperature sensitivity. Uh, let's, let's imagine that if there is a case where temperature uncertainty, imagine that that correlation coefficient is positive. I'll tell you a narrative in a minute. Then, uh, then that would price down carbon. And if it's negative, it would price up carbon. So let me do the, the interpretation of that as I go to the next slide. Otherwise, I go to the next slides for nothing. But so, so basically, all these effects, what I'm talking about, are hedging effects. And they, they are multiplied by the coefficient of relative risk aversion. There is an offsetting effect, which is this minus one. And that's also mentioned. These two effects are mentioned by Derek Lemoine. But here is done in a formula context. And this is the hedging effect is just as I've discussed it for the damages. I will discuss this later. And the minus one is just the fact that, yeah, if you have damage rate uncertainty and capital growth, uns uh, growth uncertainty, it's to do with the fact that damages are proportional to GDP, and it gets an extra term, an offsetting term. Okay. So what's the imputation? Uh, if in future states of nature, asset returns are negatively associated with temperature, then the, so what would it be? So if you're in Africa, that may be the case. It may be negative. If you may be in Sussex, uh, and you certainly are able to make great wines, better than in the Champagne area, it may be positive, but asset returns and temperature will be positively correlated, generally speaking. And then, and then if it's positively correlated, then these guys in Sussex say, let it, let it come on the temperature. So they don't want to price carbon as vigorously. They will price the market. Pr carbon will be priced less by them. Whereas those who are hit a lot by them, in, in statistically speaking, they would price carbon much more. So that makes sense. So for example, another way of thinking of it, if you're selling winter garments or heating systems, if you look at those asset prices, uh, then you will push up the cost of carbon, you want a higher cost of carbon. But for industries producing wine in Sussex, this beta is positive and they want a lower cost of carbon. So, so and this one I've already discussed. So you're getting a bit of a finance interpretation. Then. So there is this paper by Dietz, Collier and Kessler. And so we've decomposed this effect uh, on the, of uncertainty in in two additional climate beta effects, which ones are just, just those, those, those two effects. And, and they, their whole paper is about this theta D effect in the risk of, in the interest rate. It's to do with the correlation between damages and GDP. And these are the correlation these stochastic shocks. They are interesting because they can go in completely opposite directions. Hmm. So then there's a final term, and I'm talking, a lot, I thought this was uninteresting, but then I talked to atmospheric physicists and they want to know more about it. So I said, well, for example, imagine that the climate temperature shocks, climate sensitive shocks and damage rate shocks may be correlated. I thought there's no reason why that, but then I talked to atmospheric physicists and they give me 10, 12 examples why that may be so. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, uh, if they are, uh, uh, positively correlated, yet you would push up the carbon. That's the last term. That's this term here. But notice that this doesn't depend on the risk aversion. Why is it? These are uh, a damage ratio shock and a temperature ratio shock. You can't hedge it with, you can't hedge it. So you, you remember you had eta minus one, you only have the minus one term here. So it's, there's no hedging term here because there's no, there's no correlation with the economy. So there's nothing to going hatching on. So therefore, you can almost write this formula down almost just like this, if you have the answer. 
bit unfair to Mark Crawford, but it's true. <laughs> so, but it, again, so 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 if if there's a correlation coefficient, then you can do that. I, I have not been able to calibrate it, but I have I've entered in long discussions with atmospheric physicists. Was it? Yeah, it was actually. It should be. Now you think about it. Okay. Um, so uh, a bit on calibration. I do very quick calibrations. It's a bit unusual. So I so maybe. I use the ensemble of projections, projections of the IPCC, and also the study by Yosetol, which has a four-box model, not a two-box model like in Golosov. And we try to fit it. So we try to fit the volatilities. They're always per square root here. We try to fit the mean. We try to fit the, the, the rate of decay, and then like that. But maybe the best thing is to show a picture. So these are, are the pictures for the impulse response function in the stock of atmospheric carbon against time. So we're doing a very simple one-box model. Uh, that's us. The blue one is Golosov, and the black one is Yosudol, and these are this whole range of simulations you're trying to fit. I think we're not doing too bad with the rest. If we had a two-box model, we can get a bit more like that. But for one box, this is fine. And then we calibrate our uncertainty ranges as well to fit roughly the uncertainty ranges in these IPCC simulations, they come from a huge from a whole ensemble of science models. So I think this is fairly standard. This is a bit more interesting. This is the climate sensitivity. Now remember, the climate sensitivity is defined by how much temperature increases if you double the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. And the transient climate response, this is this one, shows it after 70 years. And this shows it after infinite number of years, in the very long run. So this thing, uh, these are the, the, all these uh, millions of studies, well, thousands of studies in this, in this cloud. And uh, our model is the red one, and the black one is the mean of these things. We, we captured it very well with a very simple one equation model. So we're very proud of that. And it's, it's, you know this is about 1.7. And then, this is the pin that one we use as a gamma distribution. It's actually quite a bad fit. Uh, and ours is the red one, which is maybe not as good as the mean, but it's, it does a reasonably good fit. So we go with this. We think it's actually pretty good. So that's how we calibrate our the temperature uncertainty. So it notice it's different. It's notice it's much more skewed in the long run, and it's much more volatile in the long run. I mean, it's, it's more like 2.7. So if I show you that. So if you look at it, so here are the actual parameters. I, uh, don't, they don't matter, but they, I've calibrated them. And then you see that uh, uh, how close it is. We, we also match the variance. We match the skew reasonably well. Skew, uh, the, the, the variance and the, and the mean. So they have a ECS about 2.8 degrees. It's a bit lower than 3, but that's roughly what it is nowadays. And then they also match these very likely ranges extremely unlikely, likely, un very unlikely ranges, and we, it looks pretty good. So, uh, so, we, so the, the, I'm putting a bit of time on it, this is unusual. People don't do this, but I think it's actually very helpful. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Nordhaus and Moffat, which is nice to read for those of you who do integrated assessment. But there's a guy, uh, you know this guy, uh, um, my, uh, my country, uh, at our university at Vu. Uh, yeah, Richtol. Yeah. So he the, uh, Tol did all these uh, all these damage stuff. James is Harold. Is he uh, say, well, well, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but Richard did, and then then Nordhaus, I mean, bless him. I don't know. I mean, maybe he went through all these studies. So he did what's called a meta study, and he basically. Uh, well, he, did anybody read the paper on Nordhaus and Moffat? It, it's fun, because it's boring but fun. And the reason it's fun, he just very carefully said, well, you do, hey, hey, Richard, you're doing a lot of double counting of your own studies. <laughs> so there are six papers, and they're all saying the same thing. He said, well, maybe that should only count once. So, so he said, let's not do double counting. Let's cut the crap. <laughs> Typically not. That. And then another thing he said, well, everybody knows that this person is more serious than that person. So he gave kind of quality ad ad adjustments. <laughs> so he said, well, this is kind of... Yeah, not quite so serious. And this guy should be giving maybe 10% chance, and other 0.8, something like that. And they give different weights, which is very, very amusing. And then, so we used his set of damage estimates and their range of uncertainty. Well, don't look at the diagram, but basically we, 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 we have this range. 
and we have that, and we fit we fit two specifications to it. Let's not dwell on it, but it's basically we fit a proportional damages and a convex damages case. Um, but it's amusing because when you read Nordhauser's paper, the Nordhaus Bot paper, you realize it's all it's all. I mean, we are a very bad subject. I mean, a lot of environmental and climate people. We are very should be ashamed of using those damages, but we all do. Yeah, so it's not that good. Um, and, and so, so the the guys to read are Burke, he's young. Uh, there's a young guy, a very young guy in Oxford now. He's done, he's done the redone the Burke study, uh, uh, having because there's a lot of temperature variation within a year. So if you look at Peru. And America, they have the same mean temperature. You know this probably, Tony. But then Peru is like this throughout the year, whereas America goes like that. So and, the, and this within year variability has a big add-on effect on these damages that can be estimated. If you put that into Berkeley's young, it becomes a bit even more fun. But that, that's way from what we're using here. So this is in the old, the, 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 the grubby tradition that we people live in. Okay. So so then you be calibrated. Notice risk aversion four. In a quality version of a half LSC in terms of two thirds. Yeah, I will show you, talk about this later. This is market based calibration. I will talk about ethical calibration in a minute. And so, risk premium at 6.4%. So, we explain kind of not as well as we could, but we get a good crack at trying to understand the, uh, the, 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 the equity premium puzzle. Okay, so, so what we get, what you, so what we do, I'll show you some tables, and I, I will only point out a few. That if you allow for different types of uncertainty, we split up the deterministic and then we allow for all the different types of uncertainty and we get a risk adjusted. So you can see exactly where it's coming from. To calculate these tables, I'm showing you, it's just an Excel sheet. So there's no calculations. It's just literally an Excel sheet. Then Tom, not me, I must admit, he did it. We have the, the accurate answer as well. And he did it, and we have a little bit in the paper which shows that the, the formula. Does very well. I mean, it's extremely, it's extremely accurate. So, so although it's a simple rule, it actually fits the one that the, like three digits behind the comma. You don't care whether the price of carbon is 15 or 15.001. You, you, you say who cares? Yeah. So, so that's that's the idea. So, but look a bit. So, this an ethic-based calibration uh, uses a much lower rate of uh, discount. So, let's forget the details. That's where it gets more higher carbon prices. But the point is, look at this. Risk markups 59, 53, 80, 250. And then we try to understand where they come from and, 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 and why it is. So first you notice that they are all they are all the common stock uncertainty has no effect. Economic there's actually a proof that mathematically it has no effect with proportional damages. Uh, but a lot of it may be coming with ethical base, for example, from asset growth uncertainty. So I want to move on a bit. This model, what we've done, is bad in some ways. So the main criticism is the following. That these, and it's true for Pindak and Wang as well, that these models, asset growth uncertainty, asset price uncertainty, is the same as GDP growth uncertainty. And that's by nature of the implication of AK growth models. But in the practice, a, uh, asset return volatility is 12%. Growth rate volatility is one half percent per, 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 per annual. So obviously, if you use the model, would say they're the same. In the real world, they're not. So the way what finance people do to get over this problem, they say that dividends are not a claim on consumption, but they are a leverage claim on consumption. So if you say that dividends are not proportional to consumption, but proportional to consumption to the power of three, then you, you can explain uh, low uh, economic growth volatility and very high asset return volatility. So if, if that, then you probably would, might want to use those figures. Uh, but then notice that the, the markups for economic risks, although they're quite high here, they drop to almost zero because this volatility is so much lower than that. So it matters which one you use. Um, so you also see that uh, uh, and that also also knocks down all the others, because these uh, markups are, uh, as explained in the paper, they are related. If these drop, then the others drop as well, and that's why the interest rate affects. So, if you then uh, have more convex damages, so maybe uh, 
more damage like in Ackerman and Stanton or Weizmann, some of you will have seen it, uh, really shoots up the price of carbon, like $140 per, per, per ton of CO2. Uh, and then also the very convex damages, if the damage is not proportional, you get uh, also for the first time you get carbon stock, carbon risk markups, but they're so small that we can leave them out, they, they're zero, exactly zero for proportional damages, otherwise they lie out. So let me kind of give you a, a story. I, uh, out here, well, the, I want to move on and some, explain some other stuff, but I, I, I basically retell the story of the hedging in numbers, so let's not do it, so you, depending on whether these correlation coefficients go from minus one to plus one, you see that the, the, the risk adjustment goes from 40 to 28. So if we get a numerically get a ballpark on how big this hedging thing is, that it's not so you know upper and lower bound if you don't know quite what the hedging thing. So that gives information. They're surprisingly small. So they're, 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 they're not so large. So and then this is the, the one I want to look at. So this is probably the the one my favorite one. So you use stern assumptions, very low discount rate, convex damages, you get a price we call about ninety. But you have to mark it up to about 165 for all the carbon risk. This is just using GDP volatility, so, so just using it, I think, what we should use. So this is fairly small, but economic risk markup, but you still get a total markup of about 90%. So if your a ballpark thing is that if you're ignoring all these risks, particularly the convexity, it's not so much the economic growth volatility that matters, which people have often focused on, but it's actually the climate sensitivity volatility and the damage rate volatility that really makes a big difference. And it means it can be out by a factor two or three easily. And that's that's the story. So the end the end message is really, yeah, volatilities matter, but maybe it's not uh, well unless you believe that it's as a return volatility that matters, but maybe if it's GDP volatility, then it doesn't matter very much. But what really matters are these climate sensitivity and demonstration markets and the correlations between them. Okay, so I want to move on to to the next part of my talk. I, I've already said that it's uh, an aluda shorter. Um, there's some subtleties. Nobody does what uh, Elisa has done. Uh, Belfiore and also Lind does this. Uh, and, and that we, we are quite happy to, to assume uh, a low discount rate for the government and a high discount rate for the private sector. But of course then you fuck things up. Sorry, then you screw things up. Yeah, Because then, like, at least in Belfiore, and it's, 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 so if you, if the government is much more patient than you, then the government wants to do two things: it wants to price carbon, and it wants to correct your 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 impatient character. So it wants to subsidize your capital and wants to price carbon. So, but I don't think subsidizing capital because the pricing carbon is a vote winner. So there are some political things there. But the whole range of issues, also the commitment issues there. That if you start having different preferences for government, and the whole integrated assessment literature does this all the time, and I think they really should think more carefully, maybe start reading those papers and, and do a bit of that. Uh, and then we talked about these disaster shocks. So, so let me move to the, the, the second bit. So I'm going to talk about a bit of future research. So the first one is what I would call probabilistic temperature caps. So there is a, there is a different approach, and that says, no, no, so we economists, nobody listens to us. Everybody, they want carbon budgets. So, uh, do you know? Does any who knows what a carbon budget is? So it's a, it's a so it's a cap on temperature. Implies uh, let's do, we're not going to do maths. We're just going to think. So this is temperature anomaly since since my, my uh, 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 in the beginning of the industrial revolution, and there's cumulative emissions. So everybody's seen this graph. Most of you has anybody seen this? So, so you, you meant to see this is fairly linear relationship. The more we cumulatively emit, the higher temperature. So, so then there's a bit of a uh, bit of a, a, a range. So the bigger the range, and the more uh, risk tolerance you have, or, or the less risk tolerance you have, it, it affects two degrees. That's how much you're allowed to emit. One half degrees. That's allowed you allowed to emit, and you can uh, correct for risk and everything like that. So the question is, if I ask you, you're all resource economists. What should the price of carbon be? Let's forget damages. They, they people don't. If you talk to physicists, I see they, they don't. They're not interested in damages anymore. They they say, how do you price carbon? Greta. Temperature rising above 
Yeah, so what does the price cover for carbon look like? Please. Euro before 1,000 and infinity after. <laughs> well, you, they, 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 you know, who said that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so it's just a hotel room, isn't it? So, which is kind of weird, isn't it? So, so basically, you, it's just like, oil is not scarce. Coal is not scarce. We have too much of the damn stuff. I mean, it's kind of scarce, but to a certain extent, we have plenty of the rubbish. What is scarce is how much we can put up in the air. So think of that as your, you have a limit on that. You have an arbitrage thing with marginal putting an extra ton in the air and an extra ton emitting, not emitting, yes emitting, and then the arbitrage must be that the expected rate of increase in the price of carbon must equal the rate of interest. The question is what rate of interest? We'll come to that in a minute. So, so, so typically what you would get is, forget that, forget, so there are two approaches, so forget this. So this is what Nordhaus will do, grows at 2% a year, the rate of growth, and here these growth paths, hoteling paths, they grow at the rate of interest R. Now there is a paper by Ramon and Rudik in the AER, which I think counts as the silliest paper in the universe. I, mean, I like it, Derek, very much, but it has this picture in there, like, and it has this paper, it goes like that, so I'm doing it for you. Zero, I'm going to like that. So zero, 2020, 2030, it's the price of carbon, 2040, price of carbon, zero, 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 up to 2075. And then suddenly it kind of goes up to 2021. No, no, that's the optimal price of carbon according to the carbon budget approach of the only paper publishing this thing in the AER. And so basically it says go to sleep. So it, it's partially to do with the hoteling logic, because if you pin down the tail at the end very far away, because that's, that, that's pinned down by the marginal abatement cost at the point of full decarbonization, and then you roll it back at the rate of interest. You might get something out of that, but would you buy? No. I think it's, so, so these look a bit more reasonable, but the question is, what is what is the interest rate to use? And all these exercises, so uh, Christian has a lovely paper, but this is a bit of Christian stuff. So he has a lovely paper, and I would call it crazy procrastination. So all these models, they use the implied rate of interest of 5 and 12%, and you can at a ridiculous, so they use an implied rate of interest of 15%. So that means if the rate of interest is, you have a hoteling rule, then the rate of interest is very high. Uh, you put everything over there. And I understand my politi I'm a politician. I was a politician for many years, 10 years of politician. So of course, if there's something nasty, you say, yeah, yes, let's do it. But we'll do it. We'll put a committee on it. We'll do it. My successor will do it. And if there's something nice, you say, yes, I want to do it now. So, th so there is, this is plays into the minds of politicians. So, so, so Gaudier speaks of the, the big green bat. So this is very different from my approach. So he says lots of things are uncertain, not even the carbon budget is uncertain, it's political risk, future marginal abatement costs are uncertain, and the growth in the economy is uncertain, thereby emissions are uncertain. So he looks at the, so, so maybe, so he then he shows that it's very easy, an arbitrage relationship, that the growth rate of carbon prices is not equal to the save rate of interest, it's not equal to the risky rate of interest, but it has to be set to the save rate of interest plus, again, a beta times the risk premium. And where beta is basically just a correlation coefficient if you run a regression of log of marginal abatement costs on uh, log of consumption, you get some coefficient. And then if, well, as long as you've got all the right fixed effects and whatever and all the other variables that might matter, then that regression coefficient will be that beta. So he estimate, he, he does it very nicely, a very simple model. So he finds then that the beta is 1, and he finds that the, the risky free rate interest is 1%, risk premium is about 7.3%, uh, return on risk at assets is 8.4%, but, but the growth rate in the carbon price should be 1 plus beta times this, 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 uh, this, this risk premium of 2.4%. So, so this is a leverage claim. So that means use, he, basically his bottom line is use 3.5%. So that's much, much lower than what people are all using these integrated assessment exercises. Now the only, and he uses barrow style disaster of the color rate, and the only reason I'm putting this down here, that this type of discussion is not in the literature. Uh, you see, we have, I have a little, little sub-desk, I have a very small office, but I have a little desk, and it's covered in these integrated assessment studies, all these, and they're always too thick, they're very irritating. You take a paper pin there, it's delightfully thin, and you look, spend a year reading it, whereas you get these big things, and there's too much crap, and not enough questions. And, and it's partially, they're not, none of this is discussed, which is weird. So, so that's one thing. So, so, the, so the reason 
why, and I'll just give you the thing. It depends. Uh, if you say that prosperity is the main source of uncertainty, then if, and then if they part, if the beta is positive, say if it's if it is close to one, then if, property, if prosperity is higher than expected, then you emit more than expected in the future, and therefore you must abate more to stay below the cap. But if you must abate more, we have pulled back to abate because the marginal abatement cost is higher. So therefore the beta is positive. So that's his argument why that beta is positive. Am I should do it? It could easily be an alternative story, and he hasn't estimated that, that if the uncertainty in green technological program is higher, I won't go for the argument, then the beta will be negative. So it depends. So basically what you specify is two, two kind of stochastic processes, one for the growth rate uh, of the economy, and one for uh, uh, marginal abatement costs, and it depends very much on the correlation coefficient between these two. So, and, and, and that's what, so, but he has not estimated that he just derived it from a model. So that's one set of things. So this is my, so is the telling part okay? Well, I'm not sure. I would allow the damages as well, because you get this, these green paradox effects coming in that you do procrastination by it, unless you do it properly. Uh, but if you do it, you must make sure that asset prices and carbon prices are coherent. And so green investors, you should allow the fact that they pay a premium on their return to compensate for the risk they take. So, so part of the fl flexibility is that. So, so let me go, uh, say, a few minutes on this third part, which is what I'm working on now. And I said that, uh, that there's a paper. Uh, so, so risk of stranded carbon assets. And I, I need five minutes, and then I'm done. Um, so basically, a lot of people used to say this is paper by uh, in Nature, by Eakin and Eakin and somebody, McGlade and Eakins. And they just say, ah, there's so many hundred tons of carbon we can burn. And then you go, and I still do this, I ask undergrad, just go for all these books, the year accounts of the, the oil company. And Ruddick does this all the time. So, and then you, you count the reserves of these oil companies. And I'm not even looking at state oil companies. And then they're a factor five, six, ten times more than we allow to burn. So, so either, and then pension funds, they, one of their biggest shares they hold are often shell. So then, so either that means that you should, so I've short a shell all the time, I short. But maybe it should be collectively short these old companies and make a big profit. Or is it the case that markets are quite efficiently pricing, they just don't believe that there will be any ramping up of, of, of economic policy. So what they're trying to say, and I think, again, Lucas and I have seen have a similar way of thinking about it, that there is some uncertainty about whether you should price carbon more or less vigorously. So I think you have some stochastic model for the carbon price. We, we talked about policy, and I'll say it in a minute. But the point is then, it's the exploration companies who will get hit, but it's also cement factories, steel factories, coal-fired power stations, they will get screwed. So, so and, and also uh, uh, Russia. <coughs> I don't know, it's Alexandra. Uh, so I have a paper with Alexandra. Where is she? She's not in the room. I'm sure she's in the room. She's probably shy. Oh, there she is. So on, on whether uh, Russia gets stranded, so, so there is something there as well. So, so wh why do they get stranded? And uh, so economically, it's important because you look stranded assets, you type in into Google, you get millions of things from NGOs, all these NGOs, and then you read these NGOs. A, a very good one is Carbon Tracker, and I love Carbon Tracker. Who has heard of Carbon Tracker? So and then you read, but they don't get the economics quite right. So one. Sometimes there's not even many economics in it. But if they do use the economic models, I think to have to understand properly uh, stranded assets, we need to have irreversibilities, or at least adjustment costs. You can't just shift, shift the whole capital stock from coal to something green, because it's specific, it's a bit putty clay or whatever. It's something irreversibility, something else. And if that's not there in the papers, you, and then say that you need to have an asset market, so you need to have some adjustment costs to even have an asset, uh, an asset price. So, so we need to talk about that to understand why there is a carbon bubble. So, so th this is the paper I refer to Lucas and, and Soretz. So I have a little thing with uh, Armin, and I think they're maybe in some way they're similar and different. So here we do it very simple. Let's imagine that you have a business as usual, and there's some uncertainty whether the government will take action or not. And this is a more complicated, but just let's focus on this. So then what you get is, uh, here's scarcity and oil. So here it is. Look at the red ones. 
And then, ah, suddenly you find out they are going to not price carbon, and then the scarcity rent jumps up. Ah, they're going to take action, the price of carbon, the scarcity, you squeeze them, and you squeeze them out of the system. Same thing with exploration capital, nothing happens. Then suddenly business usually you get a big hike in exploration uh, investment. Uh, if you look at um, discoveries of oil and gas, as soon as you tip to business as usual, rather than that, you get a huge increase in that. So what I'm trying to say here is look at market valuation of the oil and gas industry. But again, if you tip uh, and then if the government says, ah, here it becomes clear, the government is going to be forever Trump. <laughs> you, uh, oil prices go up, coal prices go up. And, uh, and if not, then there will be a downward jump and it will take it all the way down if you take climate policy seriously and you fit the carbon budget. So, and Lucas and Soretz, that paper is different, but it's similar. It's a similar kind of uh, motivation. It's a, but it's a different, totally different model, but it's a similar kind of things you're trying to get at. So people have looked at the, the electricity power industry and they said, look, if you look at all the investments that are done there, really you should stop it immediately because if, if they are run, allowed to run the normal economic lifetime, we will definitely overshoot two degrees and we already overshoot one half degrees. So, so, so there's uh, uh, two more papers. There's one paper by uh, Caridas and Xepa Badeas. I would like to say that it's very good. Uh, and uh, basically, it's, uh, uh, they look different from Vero. So they have a capital asset pricing model. Vero has all these macro disaster risks. That's his data set. And all these disasters are, uh, are, have probabilities of them occurring, intensities. They're, they're exogenous. What they do, they say, oh, you have macro disasters, then you have climate disasters. And then they make the intensities temperature dependent. And then they try to look at, uh, uh, it's just uh, portfolio analysis, it's not general equilibrium, it's partial equilibrium. But nevertheless, they get a share of brown assets that under the different scenarios, just RCP3 is RCP8.5, so that they, you, you run down your brown assets, or you run down, so they show that how the composition of capital stocks changing the different scenarios of the uh, RCP. So they're trying to get at something differently. And they're also trying to see that if there's more global warming, then the, then the, 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 the share of brown assets must come down. So that's just the first paper I know which tries to do stochastic and finance properly. Uh, and here you see that the premium climate change risk again rises with temperature. But then that's not the case for the normal um, equity premium, the normal stuff that yeah. they are yeah, I'm, I'm, I will take less than this time for questions. So, so what I like about this stuff is uh, that it, um, it takes a normal finance framework, Wachter uh, uh, studies, uh, and where you have uh, share prices follow stochastic process. They don't follow geometric ground emotions, but they follow these, maybe you know, feather root processes or Cox Ingersoll processes. So that they are actually the, the long run of the share prices follow a gamma distribution, which is very skewed. So they use proper finance, and then the the nice thing about uh, uh, Tassos's paper is that he, he he really says in the stock market there are normal macro disaster risks. It's Barrow and all these people are doing, but there are also risks which are related to to, to climate, and, uh, 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 and and lo and behold, the the probability of these risks occurring increases with temperature. So he fits that, he calibrates a bit of work on that. And then he looks at how much of your portfolio should you put in dirty assets and how much should you put in clean assets. I think it's nice, and we haven't got enough stuff on that. So, uh, so I, li I like that a lot. Uh, um, so, and, and partially I like it because I'm doing a paper which I haven't got time. I thought of discussing it, but I thought it was too early. It's a paper with uh, Holger Kraft and Christoph Hamble there in Frankfurt. Uh, it's, it's numerical. And what we do is we take the model of the paper I discussed with Tom van der Bremen, and we make that two sectors. So we have, uh, and we have more interesting stochastics. So we have the stochastics like it also allow for point processes, disaster shocks, uh, temperature related disaster shocks like, like uh, in the previous paper. Uh, so it's, and, and, we, and we make the, the finance a bit better than what we did uh, in the paper with Tom. Because we do things numerically, we can do things better. But it is a general equilibrium model. So in the sense, it's just like there is a kind of there Epstein's in preferences, everything is explained. There's a supply, but there are investments. So you have a demand for, for capital, but there's also a supply of capital. That's, that's not there, so it's really general equilibrium. 
And, and, and it's interesting to think about it because normally when you talk about it, there is the people who've done these papers in the old literature. Uh, the, the, when you teach growth, I suppose one of the first models you teach after Solo and Ramsey is, is maybe Uzaba. Or the, the people still teach Uzaba, the, the two sector model. Maybe uh, Robert, you know? uh, the two sector growth models. We teach at pretty. I do, I'm, I'm old, so, so, so that's what I do. Be, the then before you move on to other, before you move on to direct technical change. But, but, then, so, but then, of course, in these, all these models, you know that if, if one sector is more protected than the other sector, then you just immediately switch everything into that. If the, but unless you have adjustment costs, then you get specialization in the, in the long run, slowly. But, but the same thing that if you make one of these sectors green, even on brown, you get really quick, go quickly with adjustment costs and slow them down. But with stochastics, what we get in here, what we're trying to get at, and that's what I'm trying to say, is that there are, uh, um, so basically then, then you still keep open, in, yeah, I'm done, one, I'm 30 seconds, the last slide. You still keep open the, the dirty sector because it's a form of hedge. So the, that's, the, the people have done, so it's not in macro, the papers do that. So you have a, you, yes, you, you, you don't put everything into the clean sector, but you, you might still keep open the, the brown sector as a hedge to do it. And particularly, you may keep open the brown sector for longer than you would have thought. Because by doing that, you're getting a lot of capital by which you can build, and a lot of uh, income by which you can build the green sector. So you get a lot of the stochastics, a lot of the insights and intuitions are very different. So although there's been some stuff in the pure macro, then the combining that macro with environment, I think, is relatively new, and that's what we're trying to, to get at. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah, that this is the last slide. We need more oversight. So now central bankers are getting interested. The one thing I've not discussed, which I should have discussed, is insurance industry. Uh, so, but of course the insurance industry are very important there. So it's a very rich area for work. And particularly the third part of the talk I've talked the least about is actually very important. I think uh, we'll see a lot of papers in that coming up. And there's definitely a huge, if I look at my, sounds a bit strange, but if I look at my consultancy income, <laughs> very strange, that normally would always be managing natural resources. A heavier English salaries. Now, a lot of demand is for this stuff. Everybody wants to pay just to say anything sensible about this, even one on one economics. So, that you maybe organize a conference, uh, and, then, and then the whole city turns up with the Rothschilds. They want economists to say something sensible, and another economist saying something sensible. Thank you very much. <laughs>